Cool. So uh, I don't know who, who exactly knows me in the room. Um, I'm Alex Graf. I work for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I, um, my typical turf is more in virtualization. So I'm looking at this from a, from a VM perspective, but the exact same problem set exists in, um, in basically any time you're trying to uh, copy any workload uh, and try to uh, multiply it um, by a couple of times and then keep using it. So let's just dive into um, what the actual issue is. Let's see if this works. Ooh. So um, if you, you probably want to see me as well. There we go. Um, so if you have um, a, a typical virtualization based uh, isolation environment with um, containers running in VMs, then you, you usually have um, your Linux kernel, you have some agent that runs inside there to, to take work, for example, and that's, that's a typical serverless environment for us. Um, then you have an application runtime, say your Java environment, your, your um, uh, JIE, JVM, um, and uh, your application also wants to run some initialization code, then only after all of those things are done, you can actually go and, and uh, access um, a service, for example, a customer could then go in and go in and, and, and just try to, to access a website that you're serving or whatever it is that, you're, that your thing is doing inside your, um, your environment. Now, um, you see the arrow on the left-hand side, uh, all of that takes time. So um, every time we're trying to uh, boot up any of these environments, any of these, these containers, or um, you could also think of them as, as just normal VMs, uh, Every, anytime we do this, it, we just waste a lot of time and resources doing basically this exact same work over and over again. So um, the idea is why, why don't we just go in and save everything we've done until after the application edit, which is usually always the exact same work if we have identity configured containers, um, and then just basically serve customers from that snapshot instead of serving them all the way from, uh, from an initially like coldly booted up uh, VM. Now, um, the big issue with that is, uh, apart from technical complexities, but, but like the, the philosophical issue is, um, there are secrets hiding in any of these stages. So secrets meaning um, some kind of data that is unique to that particular boot, either um, a random number generator that was seeded using uh, initial randomness or a UUID that is generated to be unique to that particular machine you are currently looking at. Um, any of these, like if, if you're thinking of, of full blown virtual machines, it could be USSH key pair, right? Um, anything that is generated uh, on boot because you do need something secret along the way or something unique along the way that you assume 128 bits, for example, gets you enough unique just worldwide that generating it randomly just gets you um, a unique identifier. All of that is no longer true if you end up going uh, cloning that system uh, with the secrets included. So, um, Inside all, any of these stages, we have cached randomness, we have generated keys, we have unique identifiers, and sometimes we even have negotiated unique, uh, unique identifiers. So think of um, a, a handshake between a, uh, say, database server and your client. Well, they do negotiate some unique uh, identifiers to talk to each other um, as, and on, on a concrete um, basis so that the server knows which uh, what the client is and who the client is. Um, well, these no longer um, work if you if you start cloning the system because uh, you now have for example 500 different uh, clones that all say i'm the exact same entity and that obviously isn't quite true um, so the the basic conclusion that we came up with um, in, in discussions with the system defaults and internally and a few others um, was that we do need to have um, two phases in addition we need to have a a phase that is um, quiescing the system that is um, shutting pieces down or making them aware that there will be a snapshot taken of the system really soon. And then there should be an unquiet phase. And only after the unquiet phase is done, only at that end of that phase, we do want to be able to um, retrieve network uh, interactions from the outside, which is the only thing that's actually observable from the outside. Um, so during the quiet phase, um, we want to, for example, delete secrets um, to make sure that the snapshot doesn't include uh, any secret material. Uh, we want to disable network access um, potentially so that uh, we don't have anybody talking to a service while we are um, in that limbo phase where we don't know if we have still old secrets or new secrets. Um, and then after 
we are resuming that snapshot, we then want to go and um, reseed PRNGs um, to the random number generators. Um, so the kernel one, uh, OpenSL has its own uh, to the random number generator, for example. A um, few others, uh, there were caches of, of random number generators all over the place. Um, we want to generate new secrets, uh, key material, um, UUIDs. We want to introduce a, um, a file like run system ID is the current proposal. Uh, that contains a un unique identifier string uh, that an application can use to find out if something was update, updated to also make it um, possible to lazily uh, identify uh, whether the system was updated between point time X and Y. Uh, and then eventually enable networking again to get access to the system. So the current proposal of all of this is using system D inhibitors. Um, and I, I, I can virtually see the room of people in this, like the, the, the face in this room um, already start cringing. Um, the idea is, uh, like this, this is what we ended up uh, coming up with, with uh, through a couple of conversations with system D folks. Um, it's, it would work the same way suspend works. So you could have an application using a dbus message. It would say, well, Yes, you can go into this, this snapshotting state, um, but before you do that, please let me know so I can do some cleanup work uh, before you end up going there. And the exact same for the other way around. Um, after you've done uh, snapshotting, after you're done resuming, it would say, yeah, sure, you can resume, but before you finish your resume thing, um, please allow me to do some work. Um, and that's exactly the notion and the, the, the semantic that we could use um, to, to implement this. Now, um, the problem is how, how does that scale? So, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the whole reason why um, we have this conversation and I want, wanted to have this, this session um, at, this, at, at LPC. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in ideas and, and, and uh, thoughts on who else was running into these issues and, and how we can solve them, maybe in a better way, or maybe this actually is the way that we really want to pursue. So this is great for an application. I have an application that's a Dbus client already, some GNOME thing, whatever it is. Um, and uh, that one can just go and register uh, to, to such an event. That's cool for desktop systems, and if I really have a full-blown desktop VM, um, that works great. Uh, but then, does that really work in, in containers always? Do we have the um, mechanisms there? Do we even have Dbus there? I don't think so, usually. Um, does that work in libraries? Um, so if, if I am OpenSSL, um, do I really want to link against uh, Dbus? Uh, just to be able to find out that something happened. I mean, one of the things that you, uh, whoops, uh, that you, so if, if you're coming from VM land, obviously, and uh, in VM land, the question of whether or not what's running in the VM is usually, well, Linux system with uh, an init system, right? And uh, we, we yep. do have a large amount of container workloads where we do run full init systems, those wouldn't have a problem. But if you have come from the application container world, like Docker, Podman, and whatever it is nowadays, then you will have a problem because you will need, yes, you will need some sort of agent or uh, something essentially that forwards to the container um, that this uh, QS space has now, has now started. So yeah, you will need external tools for those workloads. And this will probably constitute most of the microservice workloads right. that you have, like all of the Kubernetes workloads and so on, probably. Exactly, and they, they are really interesting for exactly that type of, um, of snapshotting and restoring. Um, so what, what would be a great mechanism there, right? Um, okay, let, let, me, let me throw out ideas that we, that we came across. Um, so, so one idea is, um, I, I mentioned the run sysgen ID here. Um, we could literally just have a file and every time you're um i think i have there you go um i have a snippet of pseudocode um you could literally just have a file and every time you're trying to access something that is supposed to be unique um, in your code uh, you would just try to make sure that the file is identical it wouldn't be as dumb as this code it would right. usually go and m map the file and actually do a mem compare um, but the, the basic idea still stands, right? You, you would basically, every time you're before, like in, in your getter function for a secret or for um, anything that is supposed to be unique, you would always need to go in and check whether your file is identical. And that way you wouldn't need any of these um, dynamic mechanisms to keep that, that uh, to, to, to create this inhibitation function because we, we can basically make, in a, in a typical container world, 
the only entrance to the to the VM or to the container um, is through network. So as long as we make sure that we update this file before we open network access again, we usually are safe enough um, to not create races uh, where you might be running a code path with the old generation um, and still handle a new connection. I mean, it's way easier. One thing to keep in mind that it's way easier to interact with a container than with a VM, right? You don't have to just rely on network. You can also uh, directly attach to the containers namespaces, for example. Um, true, true. But we're talking about um, snapshots here, right? Um, so uh, in that case, it would be Creo, Creo for example. Creo would do the snapshot, and Creo could then again make sure that um, only after the file is placed with an updated ID, um, it would actually go and resume the processes that run inside. So this would be bind mounted into into the container, I assume. Oh, Adrian, sorry, you wanted to say something. Um, no, I, um, we discussed this shortly on on the Creo side. Also, um, not for secrets reason, more for the um, our motivation was to help the, the JVM people because they said they want to use checkpointing, but they want to clean up the memory a lot before they can do the checkpoint because they can throw away a lot of things. So um, we also thought about it, but we also don't have a good idea how to do it um, in a good way. So I just wanted to mentioned this here it doesn't help but um we are in the same situation definitely for creo so how the the run sysgen id file is independent of how the notification comes to the container this is what i wanted to ask right because you said the the container is supposed for sure. vm is supposed to check this file right and it does get notified how by a system b uh, uh, for example or by a, a another tool like an agent so all of that can be easily implementation defined. Um, so the, the yeah. way um, we were originally thinking of this was to have a kernel driver for um, the VM Gen ID uh, virtual oh. device that Microsoft defines. And then as soon as that event comes in, you would basically go and generate that file again. But that again needs some quiescing of network. Uh, you could, like in, in an actual container world, it's much easier because you can control the file system from the outside. Okay. So you can literally just like actually have that be a real file and just write to it. Right. It could just be temp events then, the file. Yes. For a normal container. Um, in, in a VM, you could also just implement it using an agent if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Question. Does um, I notify work across um, Creo checkpoints and restores? Because the easiest thing to do, I, I think, would just ha um, have wh whatever cares put an I notify on that, you, you, you know, look for notification that the file's been modified like we do for directories and stuff and and then you wouldn't need the, anything external yeah um the, the the big issue when you when you get down to these um super asynchronous interfaces and i, I notify is is very asynchronous uh by nature is that you never know when you're done so so the the big issue that we that we are facing here is that we never want to be able to reply with out reseeding randomness in the application. So let, let's just take an example. Assume assume you have um, a, a an SSL thing, something that that basically uses uses TLS internally, um, and we uh, and and the PRNG is um, is is already preceded uh, in your snapshot. Now, if you if you resume using I notify, if you resume and you notify that uh, the resume happened only using iNotify without any checking that all the iNotifies are processed, then uh, you may be responding to an outside connection with exactly the same random number as the TLS negotiation seed, which means that all of your TLS sessions will be insecure, mm -hmm. potentially. So you, you want to make sure you never get into that um, that, that race. You, you really want to make sure that every time you ever use a secret, um, after that, that checkpointing, uh, that, 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 that restore was done, that you ever use a secret, it always uses the new secret. And you never get into a situation where you may be potentially leaking uh, all secret data in. Otherwise, yeah, not very secure. Is the system call for getting a secret from the kernel so expensive that yes. you don't just want to use that? Yes, it is.
I think there was a discussed on list right as well. Yep. Well, it's like not, it's it's. It, go ahead. If I'm understanding right, it's not just where the secret is stored. It is operations in flight that are based on the secret, right? Like if I have some SSL yes. session key or something, and I have started negotiating an SSL session, then I will have retrieved the secret from the kernel. And so your argument, I'm trying to think through how we would use this internally, and I think the answer is it could work. Your argument is that for running systems, you use the quiescing API, and for systems that use this file, you're insisting that all the network connections be torn down before and then re recreated. You're not doing any TCP repair or anything. And Correct. that's supposed to tell you. So I'm thinking through gRPC and other, you know, HTTP2, all those other interesting network protocols. You're thinking all of these, we would teach the library to say, next time you actually open a socket or next time you open a UDP stream or whatever it is, check this file before you start. So even if you think you have a session to resume, check this file before you start. Yep. Okay. Well, like in, in, in essence, what really will happen is that in, in the background, all of these are going to use just a lib, lib um, crypto or lib, uh, whatever um, that, that is providing the PRNG for them. That really is the thing we care about. Uh, and uh, that one would just on in it, uh, open the file and map it. And then just every time you retrieve a new um, randomness hash, it would just go and check whether um, the, 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 the contents change. And so you're expecting that OpenSSL will return some sort of state error if I have an SSL object that is lasted across two different system IDs, and then the higher level client will have to delete the SSL object and create a new one? I don't think we can do that. I, I, it, it, that won't be a super break and change for a lot of um, clients, right? Basically, I'm thinking uh, you, this has to be a higher level thing than SSL because it's connected to whether your TCP connection or your higher level HTTP connection is in use or not. And so it's not just mm -hmm. the SSL library, it goes into the application protocol. And so the application protocol has to know I'm starting a new application level connection and therefore I need to start a new session. But I, I think it can work. I just think you need to teach the HTTP and gRPC libraries and all of that about it. You can't only teach OpenSSL. I mean, this, is, this was one of the arguments raised in, in one of the threads that I saw in System D, right? This is essentially a, 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 a protocol that you need to plumb to all of the interesting applications uh, throughout user space, right? So everyone needs to adhere to that, needs to learn how to deal with that. Yeah. Correct. And, and then the question is how many shortcuts we can make by, for example, demanding that network is just torn down until we have um, anyone that, that not needs to dynamically uh, retrieve secrets um, is, is up again. Correct. So we don't, you don't get into the situation where a session is already negotiated. And this can potentially block indefinitely. Is there like some sort of timeout? Like, how do you think, like, for example, this happens when everybody has reported back until, oh, uh, Andre uh, and QI have asked, uh, I have asked enough questions. It's fine. Uh, Andre, I think you were first. Uh, go ahead. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. So my comment is about the case when we want to migrate containers. If we want migrate containers, we want to to get the same secrets what we got on the previous machine, and we we need to handle this case somehow too, and we we need to remember this use case because I think in for many in many cases it's more interesting than just cloning containers. I think they're both super valid use cases. Um, yeah, but I, what would keep you from from just just copying the system ID over and not injecting any any callbacks? We can do this. I I just mentioned this use case just to remember that we have it, and when we're thinking where we want to save these secrets in the kernel, in user space, or anywhere else, we we need to remember that. We have this use case and we need to handle it. it it's not a question, it's just a, a comment. For... Um, small, small comment here um, uh, about the thinking and stuff. You want to throw away the secrets in, in your um, restartable whatever container shutdown phase, um, in the quiescence phase, not in, 
And so all restart needs to do is rebuild them. And then you don't have to synchronize. You don't have to wait until everybody's noticed. You, you do that all in your shutdown, your cleanup phase. Um, and that's much easier. It is, it is, it is easier um, to, to an extent. So um, let, let's assume we want to do this. Um, what, what interfaces would we build for it? So um, again, we, we're getting back to square one where we don't have DBus and system D inhibitors in, in most of these containers. So what would the interface be to notify every single consumer of secrets that they shouldn't be doing secrets right now? I mean, and throw them all there, around. There are two interesting, uh, there are two interesting ways that I uh, could think about, but uh, the, we should really get to KY's questions uh, first, I think, because he's been waiting for, for a long time. Sorry, I'm playing the dad here. Um, KY, please go ahead. Have you uh, joined with audio? Uh, I think he's rejoining. Uh, where, where do you see that KY wrote something? Uh, he had uh, like raised his hand. There's like an option to raise your hand. Uh, uh, okay. um, uh, and they did this as well. And maybe I'm just seeing it. Uh, yeah, um, everyone else, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, KY has rejoined, but only in listen-only mode. So KY, if you leave the session, you join it again, and then there is like an option to select a microphone uh, or uh, join with the microphone or with in listen-only mode. Um, so maybe try that. In the meantime, um, I think uh, one of the ways is, uh, as you said, implemented in uh, via systemd, right? And every container runtime that we know about that implements a container runtime, which even for application uh, container runtimes, they will have a stop in it, like a really mm -hmm. dumb, dumb init system because they can't run their workload as PID1 for PID namespace specific reasons. It doesn't matter, but um, so you could either plumb it into this stop in it, it would probably be a separate patches to the container runtimes, or usually what is done uh, is uh, to bind mount some notification mechanism, for example, into the container. You could think about, for example, bind mounting a socket that you could subscribe to. Subscribe to. Um, that could also work, right? Why is everybody raising hands? <laughs> Jeffrey? Sure. I'll, just, I'll just go ahead then. I actually think it's yeah. easier, preferable, to use the sysgen ID, assuming it works, because then you don't have to think about taking non-event aware libraries and making them event aware. You don't have to think about this library is meant to be just called with functions. And now I need to sort of asynchronously propagate some information to it. You just say, next time I call this library, it's the library's job to check when it calls a function. I think it'd be easier to integrate, especially with weird and legacy libraries. I can imagine stuffing the sysgen ID patch into a weird library much more easily than I can imagine, you know, proper event and debus support. So I don't, I don't know what, I'm curious what you think, if you think the best approach is preferable when you can use both. Okay, just a quick uh, interjection, KY is back. Uh, KY, you can go ahead if you want. I don't see KY. Okay, then we need to move on, sorry. <laughs> well, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Christian. Uh, hi, Alex. Yep. Uh, so uh, on the very first slide, the problem you're trying to solve was to see, you know, not pay the cost of all of the initialization that you had to do each time you had to start up an application. Clearly, there was a phase there that uh, began initializing the application, but there were a bunch of things prior to that. What if we cloned prior to the initialization of the app itself, a lot of the app specific state that is getting created that you're trying to solve here uh, would go away and still you could get some benefits of uh, you know starting off at a much further point in the startup sequence. Uh, do you have any sense as to how much of the savings this last step would give you as opposed to just defining the problem away? Yeah, um, that, that absolutely depends on the application. 
should be so big. Um, if your if your application is um, a super fast, I don't know, like Rust application, right? Um, that just opens a couple of sockets and is done. Uh, that, that saving is not a lot. It's not a lot. You, you, you basically just um, save a couple of, of pages um, from, from, from disk and that's that's almost it. Uh, the and a bit of memory management um, setup, but overall like milliseconds probably. Um, if your application is is a full like 500 megabyte Java beast, um, we're talking seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, we are three minutes over, but I think this is fine because we're running and we run over into the break. But we will now have a 10 minute break or rather seven minute break and then question give me give me give me two seconds give me two seconds um if anybody's interested in the topic um and and this is trying to pursue similar um endeavors or wants to just um figure out uh, how how to best um tackle it in a, in a full community fashion um get to me on on my matrix so that we can um start to to uh consolidate efforts cool um they know how to reach you i guess well i'm i'm on matrix i'm on the channel so um just cool. just yes let's use the plumber too excellent